Thank you again, Mr. Shoemaker. Yeah, I, I really do appreciate this time of year, you know, as the, the temperatures are changing and the, you know, the seasons are changing. And, and again, this is bringing up the fall holy days. And I know we appreciate all the holiday seasons, and um, sometimes some of them, um, for whatever reason, mean a little more. And, and not that they're more important, but for us individually. You know, we've experienced things, and we've done things, and whatever. But anyway, uh, I really appreciate this time of year, the fall holiday season. I really appreciate our history, our history in God's church. Looking back over the years that we've all been in the church, how many times have we heard a vision of the thousand-year millennium? What the Feast of Tabernacles represents. It's always been an inspiring time that we have to look forward to. It's a hopeful time, and that is all true. It is. Most all remember the wonderful things that we were told over the years um, through sermons and messages, through God's Word, prophecies um, that will be uh, coming to fruition in the very near future that have already come. All this thing, all these things that are going to occur, if you put yourself in that future, the things that are coming, what you and I, brethren, have to look forward to, the millennium's peace, how about the health, the prosperity, how about the unity, that alone means so much. All these wonderful things, tremendous time that we have to look forward to, right? Well, yes, it is. But with all that said, I wonder how many of us as God's children have maybe not realistically considered what it's going to take to get from where we are today to that point of the millennium and into and through the millennium. In fact, brother, perilous times are coming. Think about this description I'm going to go over for the next just few minutes. Just let your mind go and think about this description as I share it with you. And this is what's coming. The world will just have witnessed a seamlessly endless war, conflict, a disturbance that has left nearly one-third of the world's population dead. As today, that's about two and a half billion people. More than one-third of the sea creatures, they will be killed because of this war and this destruction that's coming. More than a third of the livable plants, the usable plants, all that will be destroyed. You think about it, the trees, the crops, the grass, the general vegetation. This is what's coming. Even the night and the day skies. It doesn't just end there. The night and the day skies, they will have been altered. The dust and the debris from the wars, the environmental disasters that's coming, they will have filled the sky so that even the midday sun will be darkened out. And then, all of a sudden, it happened. There was an invasion. There will be an invasion that seemed to come from space. And it was unlike anything that the people have ever seen before. Just as this invasion was happening, hundreds of thousands of corpses erupted from their graves all over the world. But even before the fear of those who witnessed this and saw what was happening began to subside, those corpses that rose from the grave, the dead, they disappeared into the clouds. Then the war started again. Millions had died, but it seemed only this time to be the ones that had embraced the world ruling government that had risen to denounce and dominate God's government over the last number of years. 
Now, the armies of all those former adversaries combine their military might to fight this new threat, at least as they perceived it, from outer space. They had gathered in a place not too far from Jerusalem. We're familiar with this place. It's called Megiddo. They gathered there to fight this alien army. What they never considered as a possibility was that they might not win. In a flash, those armies simply disappeared. It was over. Something almost intangible had happened, just like that. It was as if a truly evil force had simply been removed. In fact, the aliens, if you will, from outer space seem to be here to help mankind. The leader of this force glowed in his presence. His face and his clothes, they radiated a very brilliant bright light. The armies that he brought with him, they were in similar appearance. And they all began working together and healing the people. They began providing for the immediate needs of those who had survived all those terrible, terrible events and all those who had lived through the wars and a time like no other. Brethren, a new chapter in mankind's history had begun. People are starting to be taught how to live in peace and how to live in harmony, how to treat the land as God intended. Brother, there's no doubt that we live and will continue to live in more perilous times as we approach this time in the future. And events will only get worse the deeper we go into Bible history, Bible prophecy into our lives, into the fulfillment of the return of Christ and beyond. In the time that pictures a millennial reign with Jesus Christ is absolutely what you and I are looking forward to, and that's just the beginning. That's not the end. There's so much more. But for the first time ever, think about this, the first time ever, mankind will be taught to live according to God's way of life. What a wonderful thing that'll be. Can you imagine? Well, hang in there. You will get to see it. But we also need to understand that while Satan will have been removed at this point in time, by the beginning of the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles, the millennium, his influence does not immediately disappear. And we have to understand that. So, the question we might ask is, what does the Feast of Tabernacles mean to you and me? Is it simply a utopian idea? Is the millennium simply a time to rest and rejoice because we are no longer physical? Brother, do we see ourselves working beside Jesus Christ? Do we see ourselves working with the rest of his saints to teach mankind how to live, how to restore the physical creation that had been completely destroyed? Do we see ourselves helping to teach them what God really wants and what he intended for all mankind all along? What will the millennium really be like? I'd like to start, if you will, in Isaiah chapter 11. You can join me in Isaiah chapter 11. This is a wonderful section of scripture that during the feast we do read quite a bit. This pictures a time that mankind has never experienced since the Garden of Eden. And it's a time when even nature, the animals, will be at peace. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6. 
The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like an ox. At this point, brethren, everything that will be done and moving forward will be done under the direction of God's word. We can't deny that. Isn't that exactly what we're wanting? Isn't that what we're working for now? Isn't that what we're waiting on? In a world filled with such a scary turn of events that will happen in circumstances that are upon us now even, we see the vision of peacefulness, a future that you and I look forward to, which is a very powerful reassurance of the hope, brethren, that you and I have of this future. But the question is, how long will it take for this to truly take place? When Christ returns, will he wave a magic wand and it will all be done? No. Will all this that we just read in Isaiah happen immediately? It's going to take some time. God's government at that point has begun. Satan has been removed. And these are great things. The healing of the nations and the earth, it begins almost immediately. But how long until these verses in Isaiah that we just read are fulfilled? Some of you may remember years ago that Mr. Armstrong speculated that it would take probably about three generations, about three generations for sin of the fathers to dissipate or at least start to dissipate. Well, think about why that could be the case. Here's the thing. We have about 6,000 years of mankind's influence. We all face that. The way we think, the way we act, the, the, the way the world behaves, everything that mankind has been involved with and is still involved with, all of this, like it or not, is based on Satan's foundation, direct or indirect. That won't disappear overnight. That's going to take some work. The survivors into the millennium will have a lifetime of habits and choices of human nature to overcome. So just think about this in our own personal life. How hard is it for each and every one of us to overcome one little bad habit? Whatever it might be, the simplest habit that we fight and fight and fight to overcome. Let alone a lifetime of not knowing God's truth, not being exposed to God's truth. It won't happen overnight. You might turn to Ezekiel chapter 38. Ezekiel 38 gives us a, a glimpse here into the future. Ezekiel chapter 38 here goes to a different part of the vision that's extended uh, from Ezekiel chapter 37. And we all are familiar with that. That's uh, primarily made up of the Valley of Dry Bones. And that usually, you know, we, we always talk about that on the last great day, the eighth day. But here in Ezekiel chapter 38, we see a little bit more. Look, we'll start in verse 1 here. <clears throat> Ezekiel 38, starting in verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog and the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, I will, turn, I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and lead you out with all your armies, horses, horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. When is this going to take place? You think about that? Well, let's go on a little further. We'll, we'll get back to that. Verse 5. Uh, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shields and helmets. 
Gomer and all its troops, the house of Togomar, from the far north and all its troops, many people are with you. Prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about you, and be a guard for them. After many days, you will be visited. In the latter years, you will come into the land of those who brought back, those who brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. You will ascend, coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, you and all your troops and many peoples with you. Thus says the Lord God, on that day it shall come to pass that the thoughts will arise in your mind and you will make an evil plan. You will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take plunder and take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again uninhabited, and again against a people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods, who dwell in the midst of the land, Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, and all their young lions will say to you, Have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your armies to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to take great plunder? Therefore, son of man, Prophesy and say to Gog, Thus says the Lord God, On that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? Then you will come from your place out of the far north, you and many people with you, all of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land, so that the nations may know me when I am hollowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus says the Lord God, Are you he who I have spoken in former days by my servants, the prophet of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them? Again, we come back to the question, when is this? We read here through this section of scripture a time when the nations, they're armed for war. At that same time, we read that it is a time of un unwalled cities, a time of peace and prosperity, cities having neither bars nor gates. You think about this time and you do a little history uh, research on this, some theologian scholars they go back to this and they think that this is the time of the Jews in the 1940s um, where they gathered and going to the Middle East to establish the very modern nation of Israel. They see that as a precursor to the return of Christ. But when you look a little deeper, that doesn't really seem to fit the modern context of how this nation came to be. Some say this is Armageddon right before Christ's return. And there is some parallel, many of the same nations, many of the same actions and attitudes, they're all going to be prevalent there at that time. So as we think about that question, let's go to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 here, the logical conclusion is that after the millennium begins is when this war that we read about in Ezekiel 38 will take place. And that seems a bit odd. That at a time of great peace, of a great hope, as God will establish his government, that there would be such a war. Revelation 20, verse 7. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. When the thousand years are finished... Why would God do that? Well, for a thousand years, Satan has been removed. For a thousand years, God has shown mankind what was possible under rulership and under his laws 
as a foundation for everything, everything that was done. He showed mankind the right way to live, how things could be, a time of unprecedented peace and harmony, a time of Isaiah 11 that we read about earlier, when the animals will coexist peacefully together. Let's continue on here in Revelation 20, look at verse 8. And will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose numbers is as the sand of the sea. We read some of that in Isaiah or Ezekiel 38 here, that in spite of all that God has helped establish through his word, through his son, working through his saints, all of the people, everything that has been done good, everything that has been done, everything up to this point, as amazing as it will be, and as amazing and as great as that time will be, there will still be some people who say, I don't want that. That's fact. That's prophecy. Look at verse 9. They went up on the breath of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now that should be translated are as were because they were physical beings that have been long destroyed by the fire. Those who have this mindset will not exist. There has to come a change. So how can we have a war at the beginning and at the end of the millennium? Well, the simple answer is that God will not lock down society. He will not control mankind to the point that they can't make a decision. Why would he put mankind in that position? Why would he not put his foot down? Maybe that's what we ask. Why would he not put his foot down and say that he will not tolerate this? Well, it goes back to free moral agency. Even through the millennium, God still gives man free moral agency. Even though mankind will have access to Jesus Christ and will experience firsthand, none of us have experienced this, they will experience firsthand all the blessings of God's way of life. We've not experienced it to that level. We have experienced it. We're here. We're blessed to be here. But this is a whole different level. He will not make anyone choose that way of life if they don't want it. The bottom line is they have to want it. We have to want it. For the first time in mankind's history, people will have a clear contrast, a very clear contrast of life versus death, of true right versus true wrong. They will be given encouragement and direction to choose God's way of life, but at the end of the day, they have to choose. Notice this back in Isaiah chapter 30. I think you and I, brother, are going to be very, very busy, not just waiting for problems to arise, but, but rather we will actively be teaching people when we see things start to go wrong to direct them in the right way, the way that they should go. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 20. And though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teachers will not be moved into a corner anymore but your eyes shall see your teachers. The teachers, brethren, that God will put in place. Today, this world, they don't want to hear this right now. They don't understand it, and they're not interested. Look at how increasingly any thought that comes from Scripture um, is not only marginalized, but it's also actively suppressed. I mean, I could give a big list. I won't, but I could read a big list of truths that we live by that the world hates. 
But that will change. It will change, brethren. Continue on in verse 21. Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way. Walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. I think the reason that this will be the case is because that you and I, as God's helpers, saints, working with Christ, will be there. We'll be there to kind of point people in the right direction. We won't be able to make a choice for them, but we'll be there to guide them. No different than what God is doing right now. He doesn't make a choice for us, but he guides us. He directs us. Maybe we'll have an opportunity to share some experiences from our own life. Saying, hey, listen, you know, Joe, um, no offense, Joe, <laughs> nothing personal, but maybe um, you don't want to do this because a thousand plus years ago, <laughs> or whatever the case might be, I did that, and it didn't work out so well. You know, we'll, we'll be there. You know, our life that we have today, this physical life, we are learning unbelievable uh, lessons if we take the time to learn them. And we can teach them along. We should be teaching them along. It's interesting to consider that even in the millennium, as we just read in verse 20, it says that there is going to be adversity and there's going to be afflictions. It will be, again, an unprecedented time in man's history, but it is not a utopia yet where there is no issues, where there's no conflicts, where there's no troubles to overcome. Mankind still has to prove himself. Even then, there will be people that aren't going to want to listen. Initially, hopefully, <laughs> as we go through it, that they will. But we know, as we read from Ezekiel chapter 38, that even at the end of the millennium, after the thousand years, of peace and prosperity, there will be people so bent on rebelling against God, thinking that their way is right, that they know better, that they will say, no thank you, I don't want it. And it's just hard to believe. Hebrews chapter 2, I'd like to go there just for a minute. So what is God's purpose in the millennium? Is it to Make it a Garden of Eden? Well, the thing is, that will happen as a consequence, or maybe as a result, I should say, of the righteousness that will be taught there and that will be lived. But that is that the purpose? We know from other uh, prophecies that it will take, uh, it talks about the plowman, overtaking the reaper. Uh, we, we read prophecies about the land will be so healthy that the, the produce uh, will be so amazing in terms of quantity and quality that there won't be enough time to collect it all in before it's time to plant again. <laughs> Have we ever seen that? No. But is that the purpose? Hebrews chapter 2, and verse 10. I think we can clearly see here in Hebrews what God is trying to do. Verse 10, for it was fitting for him for whom all things and by whom all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings in bringing many sons and daughters to glory. The plan of God is not finished. When the millennium starts, the plan of God is not finished. When the millennium is finished, the plan of God is not finished. There's more. As this time begins in fulfillment, there's still about a thousand years, a little, little more, and how many people will live into that time period? We don't know. Several billion. And how many people wait in their graves right now. We have no idea. The plan of God is not done. And that's a great thing. There is still 
a lot that needs to be done and needs to be taken care of at this point in the future. You and I still have a lot of work to do, <laughs> even now. But at that point, we'll have a lot of work to do under the direction of Jesus Christ and God the Father. Notice what it says in 2 Peter chapter 3. We covered this just a few weeks ago as well. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. We see God's desire here. 2 Peter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness. You know, God is not slack. How patient and merciful is God? Do we know? How long has he waited for his plan of salvation for mankind to play out? How much has he tolerated, hoping that everyone, brother, everyone, will have been born, who has ever been born, will be in his family. He goes on to say, the Lord is not slack counting, uh, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as Sam counts slackness, but is long-suffering, is patient towards us. He's very patient. Think about these questions. How long, how many hundreds of years did he wait for the Amalekites to change? They never did. How many years did he wait for the Egyptians to change even though they kept Israel in slavery? Well, we think of 430 right off. Was it more? How many years? Now, this is where it gets personal, brother. How many years did God wait for you and me to finally begin to pay attention to what he was trying to teach us? He goes on to say, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But as we talked about, he's not willing. He doesn't want that. That's not his desire for any to fall away. But we have to make our own choice. He wants all mankind to have what you and I have right now, brother, and what you and I will be picturing here in three weeks. He wants, us, he wants all to have that. The way... This will happen, the fulfillment of 2 Peter 3, verse 9, the way this will take place and be fulfilled is primarily through individuals making godly decisions. It's kind of almost blows you away to think that our personal salvation, our personal future comes all down to the decisions we make. But that's where it comes down to. What are we going to do? And again, as we've said, in spite of everything that he's going to show us, that he's shown us now, he's going to show us in the millennium, there's going to be people that say, no, not interested. Satan will be bound at the beginning of the millennium. But as we mentioned earlier, it will probably take several generations for that influence to wane. The result of that influence, the pattern of thinking of an individual, an individual's mind, the way they are, who they are, that usually doesn't change right away. And we can all attest to this. Throughout our life, we've all been asked to change. And it's taken time. Sometimes it's taken weeks, years, decades. I'm confident that it will drop off dramatically. Things, I, I believe, things will begin to change very quickly. But the fact is, even once something negative, a negative force is removed, people don't change their mind completely all at once. It takes time. Think of the aspects of overcoming that you and I have made. I go back just to COVID. We've had to have, we've changed our life a lot. A lot of things have changed. They have been and are still hard things to do, to deal with. And we're going to have a lot of challenges until that time comes. People have challenges. They face challenges, but they grow from it. It makes them a better person. It makes them a better Christian. It makes them a better child of God. The challenge, all challenges with human nature probably are not going to be that much different in the millennium than you and I have faced in our life. 
although it will be a much better environment, a much better environment to work in because that negative influence, the major negative influence, will be gone. Human beings will still have the ability to make choices and decisions during this time. Currently, most of the world makes choices that allows them to live what we call below the line, where you know, we, here in this country, despite all the troubles that we can see in our lives, and we face a lot of troubles, there's, we deal with lies, we deal with difficulties, we deal with trials, we deal with all this stuff, uh, and whatever the struggles might be, we, brethren, live like kings and queens compared to the rest of the world. But in the millennium, everybody, everybody will have the opportunity to live above the line. We won't be running around like crazy people like we are today, not knowing what's coming next, not taking time to stop and breathe. Interestingly, doctors today say that most of our illnesses are due to our lifestyle. Well, that makes sense, don't it? Our pace of life, the stresses that we face in life, our eating habits. Let's go to Matthew chapter 18. There's a lot to consider in this, and let's understand that the millennium will be a wonderful time. It will be a great time. It will be better than anything that we have ever experienced on this earth. But sometimes we can think that it's finished once we reach that point. We need to remember there's more. Matthew 18 and verse 21 is the parable of the unforgiving servant. Matthew 18 and verse 21. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Now, what we need to remember is in the Jewish culture of the day, Peter was very generous. So, he offered seven times to forgive someone. That seemed to be pretty generous. Look what Christ said. <laughs> Verse 22. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times. He exponentially multiplied that number <laughs> to the point that he meant as much as necessary. That's what he's saying. You don't put a number on it. If somebody comes to you and they sincerely ask for forgiveness, you forgive them. Do we argue that? We probably better not. Look at verse 23. He gives him a parable. Christ gives him a parable here. He said, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that they had, that, he, that the payment be made, the servant... Uh, therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of the servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him his debt. So what a great example here. He was moved with compassion. And he didn't just release him from the prison they was going to put him in, but he said, You're forgiven. You no longer owe me this debt. He said, Go, be free. Can, can you imagine the burden? You know, probably a lot of us have a house payment. What well, if we'd go to the bank and say, I just can't do it anymore? And the banker would stand up and say, here, this is your note. Tear it up. Go, free. Can you imagine that feeling? What about this? His whole family was going to be in prison. He said, go, you're free. Did he appreciate it? <laughs> Look at verse 28. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, almost nothing in comparison to what he owed the other guy. And he laid hands on him, and he took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. What a double standard here. The mercy that had been extended to him 
wasn't even in this guy's mind at this point. Verse 29. So his fellow servants fell down, or fellow servant fell down at his feet, and he begged him, saying, Have patience with me. These are words coming back to him. It's what he said. He said, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not. But he went and he threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. <clears throat> so when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved. And they came and they told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. So you, uh, should you not also have compassion on your fellow servants, just as I had pity on you? There is something in our human nature, and we all know this, that it wants a pound of flesh when we feel that we've been wronged. We always want to get even, right? But that's not what God is looking for in a servant. That's not what God is looking for in a child. Should we not forgive our fellow servants as much as God forgives us? Try to put that on your heart. Think about God forgiving us. For me, how, I, I could not tell you how many times God has forgiven me. How dare I not forgive somebody else? The lessons, they will need to be taught and they will need to be learned. Look at the problem in the world that would be solved if individuals simply applied this parable. It would be a different place, wouldn't it? Brethren, you and I will be teaching this, this parable, among other things. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, in verse 1 here, we have the parable of the wedding feast. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 1. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parable when he said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding. And they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it, and they went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, destroyed these murderers, and burned up their city. Brother, you and I have been invited to a great wedding. The Feast of Tabernacles is coming up, and that's what it pictures in part. Are we worthy? There are a whole lot more people in this world, at least from our perspective, that we might think have a lot more talent, that they might be a lot smarter than us, they may be more sophisticated, they may be a lot more of everything. But brethren, that's not what God's looking for. Not right now. He's looking for individuals who want to be in his family, who have a strong desire to be in his family, who are committed to being in his family. That's what God's looking for. And for whatever reason, He's called all of us. What a great thing. Do we thank him for that on a daily basis? I hope we do. Verse 9. He went on and said, Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. The fact is, brethren, God will call in the millennium, just like he's calling today, but he will do it on a much greater scale. Percentage-wise, you think about it, we as Sabbath keepers, 
we are not even a fraction of 1% of the world's population. There's not that many Sabbath keepers. There's not that many people that God's calling right now. Let's go back to Daniel chapter 2 and look at one of these prophecies. Daniel chapter 2 here. God always starts small, and he builds from there. And even in the millennium, not everything is going to be taken care of right away. This is because God wants effort from those that he is calling who's going to be there. He wants people to want what he has to offer. He wants people to value what he has to offer as he does. And he wants people to make it theirs. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 34. This is Daniel's vision being explained to him. Kind of breaking into a thought here in verse 34, Daniel chapter 2. So you watched while a stone was cut out with hands, which struck the image on his feet of iron and clay, and broke them in pieces. Now if we remember the understanding from the golden image here, it was made with gold on top, then silver in the middle, and bronze at the bottom. And then finally, there was a mixture of iron and clay for the feet. Now we understand that this uh, statue, this uh, image, if you will, this pictures the various world governments down through time. So Daniel here, in this vision, uh, the stone that came down smashed all this. Look at verse 35. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like a chaff for the summer threshing floor. Then the winds, or the winds carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. God's government, brethren, when it comes, it is not going to try to repair the existing government, the government of this world. God's government is not going to try to build on top of what mankind has built. Instead, God is going to sweep the floor, if you will, and he's going to start fresh. He's going to bring in his government, and it will be a righteous and just government. And we notice that the stone uh, struck the image and became a great mountain. God starts small, and he builds big. What's our role in the fulfillment of this? What will we be doing? Maybe the other question is, will we even be there? Think about this point. We all, rather than all of us, have family and friends that have kept the faith and been faithful right up until their very end, until they passed away. Don't we want to see them at the resurrection of the saints? Absolutely we do. We owe it to them, if not ourselves, and especially to God, to be there. This is our chance. We need to make sure that we are there. As we begin to wrap up, let's go to Revelation 21. The point we're making is that everything, brethren, is a process. We understand that this physical life our bodies are not meant to last forever. God gave us this physical life. He gave us the knowledge that we have so that we could learn to live his way of life. And we could learn to develop his character in us. In Revelation 21, in verse 4, a very familiar scripture, a very encouraging scripture. It says this, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There should be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There should be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. When is this? We're back to that question. When is this? This is not at the beginning of the millennium. This is not at the end of the millennium. This, brethren, doesn't happen until after the last great day, the eighth day, the great white throne judgment is fulfilled. This doesn't happen until after all, all of mankind are either in God's family or not. That's when this happens. Will we be there? There are an awful lot of people 
that over the past 50 years, at least since I've been associated with God's church, that have quit. They've grown weary and well-doing. They've decided that the work of God wasn't worth fighting for. They have not remained faithful to the end. Will you and I, brethren? It's a choice. It's a choice that we have to make. God will not make this choice for us. He would love to, but if he did that, he would violate his own law by taking away free moral agency. He won't do it. Brethren, we have a great, great calling that's been given to us. It's a wonderful gift. It's a great gift from a wonderful father. We have a great week coming up in three weeks from tomorrow that we can live and rehearse this time in the future. With that said, we know that there is still a lot more to do. We are not able to just walk away. God is still setting the stage to show mankind his authority, his power, and for Satan to be vanquished in a proper way. God is still working out his plan of salvation. And while the millennium will be a, a time of unprecedented peace, of great harmony and unity, uh, the best that mankind in his history have ever had, it will not be the complete fulfillment of what God has in store for all those that he absolutely desires to make a part of his family. It's the next step. And it's amazing. It's an amazing step. But there is still more to do. Let's conclude with one final scripture and a section of scripture in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, read verses 19 through 21. <clears throat> Paul wrote this, says, Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. A building who grows together. Brother, you and I have a part to play now, today. This Feast of Tabernacles is coming up. The holy, all the holiday season. The weeks to come. The years to come. However long, we don't know. As we rehearse the weekly Sabbath, what we're doing today, each holiday season, year after year, are we working for this? Is this our goal? Or are we just here for the ride? I encourage all of you, myself included, to share whatever we have with others, even if it's only a conversation, a prayer, you know, whatever it is. Share it with all of us, our family, we want to encourage each other. Perilous times are upon us. And we want to make sure that we hold tight. This is how we encourage each other to remain faithful. And we need to be doing this. And what a difference it will make. The millennium is not the finish line. Not for us. Even though we will be spirit at the time, it is still not the finish line. It is actually just the beginning. There are billions of individuals still to teach God's way of life, and they deserve it. Shouldn't we be there to help? There will be billions of individuals that will rise from the graves that absolutely will be stunned to come up and see this. A lot of them, most all of them, they, they have never been exposed to this before. They will have no idea what is going on they will need to be taught. They will need to know how to begin to live the right way of life. This is an absolutely huge part of our calling, brethren. The millennium will be a wonderful time that will make the best that this current world has to offer look very insignificant by comparison. You and I can be there. So let's take this to heart. And let's make it real so that 
you and I not only will be there, but will be an active part of fulfilling this time in the future. I hope we all have a great Sabbath and a great upcoming fall holidays.